السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله سبحان الله العلي العظيم نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا رسول الله سبحانه العلي العظيم سبحانه نؤمن به ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستنصره ونستجيره فلا مجير غيره فإنه حق من هذا الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على الحبيب المصطفى خاتم الأنبياء والرسل أجمعين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الميامين وعلى أصحابه المختارين وعلى من اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم يا علي عظيم اللهم اصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا واصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا 
واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر لا إله إلا أنت سبحان الله We have true wisdoms, things that we say as Muslims that we have become so accustomed to. The problem with habituality, with becoming accustomed to things with developing habits, habits of familiarity, is that human beings often become complacent in their habits. And with complacency, there is also often the loss of meaning. We have the Quran in our midst. We as Muslims have the Quran in our midst. By belief, by conviction, the Quran is Allah's revelation, Allah's testament. It is Allah's testament to us. What Allah, what God chose, affirmatively chose, to leave to us as a will and trust. We don't know Allah's will. We don't know Allah's intentionalities. We are not privy, if you will, to Allah's mind. Figuratively, of course. We are not privy to Allah's plans. But the only thing we do have is Allah's words, will and trust in our midst. How did Allah's words become so ineffective? amongst the people of the book, Muslims who are quintessentially the followers of that will and testament, of that book, the repository of Allah's living words amongst us. As we reflect upon the events of the week, if one has even the slightest substance or the slightest substantive association with Islam, you would always assess what occurs in the world around you in light of Allah's will and testament, 
or will untrust both. At the very minimum, You think in terms of this world through the lens of what Allah has entrusted you with, Allah's revelation, Allah's book. Consider, for instance, in Surah Ali Amran, When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Ya ayyuhu al-lazina amanu la tattakhizu bitana, bitana tan min dunikum, la ya'lunakum khabala, waddu ma anittum, qad badati al-baghda'u min afwaihim, wa ma takhfa, وَمَا تُخْفِي صُدُورِهِمْ أَكْبَرِ قَدْ بَيَّنَّا لَكُمُ الْآيَاتِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ 118 in Ali Amran, for instance. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You who believe Do not take your intimates bithana leta takhudu bithana. Don't take those literally that become the bearers of your desires, the bearers of your will, those that you entrust with the, uh, your affairs in life. Min dunikum. Min dunikum. Outsiders, but not outsiders in the sense aliens, but outsiders, people who are not online people who do not share your value system, people who do not share your priorities in life, people who do not have the same understanding as to what this life is about or what it should be about. Bitana min dunikum. Those that you trust and in effect, you surrender your affairs to, who don't share your commitments, who don't share your relationship to your maker, who don't share your fidelity to your book or supposed fidelity. But what comes after that لا يألونكم خبالا ودوا ما عنتم خبال Khabal is a remarkable word in this context. Those people that Allah tells us don't trust, don't turn your affairs over to, don't become don't develop the type of relationship where they become 
or where they play, play a substantial role in who you are, what you do, how you think, how you make decisions. Because those folks who don't share your value system, literally, it means that they, those people, deprecate you. Khabal is not just physical harm. But it's lunacy, idiocy, loss of meaning and loss of purpose. Khabal is to think that you enjoy full, your full intellectual faculties, but indeed, in reality, you're a dunce. You're an idiot. You're a moron. When you turn your affairs over to those people because you developed a relationship with them, your role, what you stand for, what you become, becomes something not just incoherent, but idiotic, nonsensical, silly, stupid. In reality, those people don't wish you the best. They don't even wish you well. Their preferences in life is in fact to see you lowly, defeated, broken, subjugated. The role of the Quran in our lives in light of what transpires all around us in life. Okay, so this week, we all heard about how Isra the Israelis assassinated yet another Palestinian journalist. Her name, Shireen Abu Akla. shot her in the head, although she was clearly wearing the clothes indicating that she's press but they shot her in the head and killed her. Well, the reality is, the reality is, is that Shireen Abu Akla is just one of 50, 50 Palestinian journalists killed by Israel since 2001. Every single killing every single killing the Israeli government go to deflection well it's the Palestinians who shot the Palestinian 
from the time that they killed Muhammad al durrah as he was in right next to his father, using his father for cover. What did the Israelis say? Oh, he was killed in a crossfire by Palestinian bullets. 50 Palestinian journalists since 2001. Shireen Abu Akhla was an American citizen. But she is not the first and sadly will not be the last. In the same way that the Israelis murdered an American citizen, Palestinian journalist, this in fact follows or in, is in keeps with a long record of violations against journalists and human rights activists. The organization Reporters Without Borders issued a report that documents how 144 Palestinian journalists have been targeted, assaulted, beaten, wounded by Israel since 2018. 50 killed since 2001. 144 wounded or assaulted since 2018 alone. But This is a pattern and practice. Rachel Corey, the US citizen who was killed by Israel in 2003. Tom Herndahl, the British reporter who was shot and killed by Israelis as he was covering their operations against Palestinians. James Miller, Another British national who was shot and killed by Israelis. Who, James Miller was a documentary filmmaker. As he was trying to document Israeli aggressions and violations committed against Palestinians. Ian Hook, who used to work for the UN, he actually was an employee of the United Nations and a British citizen. And he was shot dead by the Israelis as he witnessed Israeli crimes being committed against Palestinian refugees. Ian Hook worked for UNRWA the refugee agency in the United Nations that is concerned with Palestinian affairs. And the list goes on and on and on. Now mind you, Saudi Arabia killed a journalist in a Saudi embassy in Turkey. Jamal Khashoggi. Although, unfortunately, Saudi Arabia got away 
with its murder. Compare the reaction to the killing of Jamal Khashoggi by Saudis. To the reaction of the world when Israel exterminates journalists, whether British, American, Palestinian, or what have you. Here is the truly Chabal part, the true lunacy. When Saudi Arabia killed Jamal Khashoggi, who went to bat for the crown prince of Saudi Arabia? Who went on a crusade to make sure that MBS is not replaced doesn't pay any consequences. Israel was quite open about its support of MBS and its insistence that in the larger scheme of things, we shouldn't alienate MBS just for a lousy Saudi journalist. Israel was extremely active in saying basically to American politicians, this should not matter. When a Muslim kills another Muslim, it shouldn't matter to us. When there was a coup in Egypt and the Egyptian military committed an urban massacre in the full view of the world, massacred hundreds of people. Who was lobbying European countries and the American government to quickly forgive the Egyptian military for its slaughter? Who was defending President Sisi of Egypt in the hallways of DC? Yes, it was Israel. And yet again, the well-known right-winger who is part of the Israeli national security apparatus, makes rounds in the US and Europe to tell the United States and Europe to stop pressuring Abdel Fattah al-Sisi of Egypt on, on human rights issues. Staunchly arguing that Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is a good man despite killing tons of Muslims, arresting tons of Muslims, torturing tons of Muslims, despite the abysmal human rights record, 
who is out there more, just most recently Iyal Khulata just one episode in a long series of episodes since the coup where Israel is at the forefront of defending Muslim tyrants at the forefront of arguing that Muslims don't need democracy. Muslims don't need human rights. And that the West should embrace MBZ and MBS and Fasisi of Egypt should embrace them. Now here's the thing. Is it embrace them despite their genocidal psychopathy or because of their genocidal psychopathy? I submit to you that it is because There was a Harvard professor some years ago wrote a shameful article in the New Republic where he said Muslims' conception of life is so different from ours the proof is how they kill and murder each other. And that is precisely why we shouldn't worry about Muslims having the same constitutional rights as other human beings or the same human rights as other human beings. How do you end up with that image Well, because we have leaders like MBZ, MBS, and CC of Egypt who have absolutely no regards for human rights or particularly Muslim rights because they might respect a Christian or Jew, but not a Muslim. Abdel Fattah al-Sisi will honor the Israelis that come to visit. They're untouchable. Will honor the American non-Muslims who come to visit. They're untouchable. But for Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, for MVZ, for MVS, Muslim life is cheap. The amazing thing is that this is precisely why Israel can kill Shireen Abu Akla and kill 50 other Palestinian journalists since 2001. And know that this is part of the universe that they engineered. Because the Israelis can murder Khashoggi, because the Saudis can murder Khashoggi, excuse me, and there be no consequences, it is part of the world that they created. They can murder Shireen Abu Akhla and there be no consequences. Israel's national security advisor goes on a mission to defend Sisi of Egypt, to insist that 
the West should stop harassing Sisi of Egypt about his human rights violations. Fanatically arguing in Congress and in Downing Street and everywhere he goes that Egyptians don't need democracy. Egyptians can't handle democracy. They need Sisi. They need someone who throws them in prison, tortures them, and murders them. Do you want to see how your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, told us about all of this and spoke to us? Saudis, as has been reported now by the Wall Street Journal, by Forbes, by every respectable newspaper, MBS and the Saudi government has a very close relationship with Jared Kushner. A relationship that had made, had earned Jared Kushner millions and millions of dollars. Just recently, Saudi Arabia gave Jared Kushner five billion dollars to invest in his business. Jared Kushner asked Saudi Arabia if the majority of this money can be invested in Israel. At the time where people of conscience are advocating divestment from an apartheid state, Jared Kushner is using Saudi money to invest in Israel. And the Saudis gave the okay, the approval. Now, does it matter that Jared Kushner is married to Trump's daughter? And does it matter that Trump has rode the wings to the presidency on an Islamophobic Trump card? Does it matter that Trump has the infamy of instituting the first Muslim ban in the United States? Does it matter that Trump is in deeply in bed with all the big, big Islamophobes in the world? Does it matter that Jared Kushner is from the very school of thought that sees Muslims as lowly animals who should be happy with material things but should not aspire to human values like democracy and human rights and civil rights and dignity. Does any of that matter? Obviously not. The Israelis can annex Al-Quds. The Israelis can have the American embassy move the embassy from Tel Aviv to occupy territory in Al-Quds. The Israelis can violate the Aqsa Mosque throughout Ramadan repeatedly, time and time again. What is their punishment? Their punishment is major financial investments 
from MBZ in the Emirat and financial investments from MBS in Saudi. That is precisely why they can kill Shireen Abu Akla and know that there are no consequences. That is precisely why Allah tells us, beware when you associate yourself with those who degrade you and deprecate you to the point that you become khabal, like mindless lunatics. How does the world look at the like of MBS or MBZ or CC of Egypt? Exactly that, khabal. Mindless lunatics. Yes, exactly as the Quran tells us. Badat al min afwahihim. When they speak, they attack your prophet, they attack your religion, they attack your faith. They deprecate everything that you are. And what is in their hearts, the hate that they have for you in their hearts, it's even bigger. But what do you do with a people who pretend to care about their God? who have sold everything, betrayed everything, abandoned everything. What do you do? You violate the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque? No, it doesn't matter. You kill whoever you kill, it doesn't matter. You annex whatever you annex, it doesn't matter. You strike them, you spit on them, you insult them and they keep coming back like a lowly dog begging for love. Accept us, please. Have us, please. Take our money, please. Take our land, please. Do whatever you want to us, please. Just allow us a space on your table. يَأْلُونَكُمْ خَبَالَ خبال. You become worthless things because of your relationship to these people. Islamophobes who hate Islam, you develop a close relationship with them, an intimate relationship with them, to the extent that they become your defenders your protectors. Sisi doesn't care about what the Egyptian people thinks of him. He cares only about what Israel thinks of him and what the Americans think of him. A hundred million Egyptians have absolutely no value. In the same way that all the Saudi citizenry has absolutely no value. What matters is that what Kushner and his father-in-law and Ivanka think or feel. Kill a million Muslims, but don't bother Jared for one moment. Exterminate all the Muslims you want, but don't hurt the feelings of Ivanka for one second. The disaster, the disaster is that this basic awareness is not common and present among Muslims. You still have plenty of Muslims who think Sisi is as an Egyptian problem. As I've said a million times, I was banned from the Islamic Center of Southern California 
because of Sisi. In their small brains and small intellects, their peanut-sized intellects, they think Sisi this is an Egyptian problem. They don't understand how Islamophobia works. They don't understand how the Quran works. How we are a single ummah. How when Muslims are devalued and made worthless in China and in Burma and in Saudi and in Egypt, I am made worthless. I, in turn, as a Muslim, living in America, working in a law school, in turn become worthless. They don't understand how Khabala works. Egypt, a major Muslim country that played a central role throughout Muslim history. Saudi Arabia, the custodian of the two holy sites. The Emirat, with all its wealth. When the fate of the historical Muslim Ummah is in the hands of those who ya'lunakum khabala, is in the hands of those who think of you as worthless things. They think of you as inferior to them. They think of you as lesser than they are. The, in the hands of those who think Human rights and civil rights and democracy are good for us, but not for you. You are savages, as when the that journalist who covered the Ukrainian invasion and said, this is not Iraq or Syria, these are civilized people. When Muslims all over the world can see the assassination of Shireen Abu Akla, a Palestinian American citizen, assassinated in the full view of the world. And then you hear a Muslim say, Shireen Abu Akla was a Christian, and she was a Christian. Can we say, Yajur, can we say Tarahum on her? That is your issue? Instead of understanding why is it that Israelis can shoot Shireen Abu Akla in the full view of the world? Why is it that the Israelis can silence free speech? And the only people who are seen as a hindrance to free speech in the world are Muslims. Why is it that the Israelis can make the policy of silencing an indigenous native population, exterminating an indigenous native population, can make that into a policy and get away with it. And no one, even the most intelligent intellectuals that inhabit our law schools and our think tanks and our schools of public policy and our schools of international relations, all of these people don't see the obvious. All what you say about Islam and freedom of speech, but you ignore the elephant in the room. How for decades, the Israelis have perfected a policy of muting and silencing any voices. Why have they killed all these American citizens and all these British citizens? Why do they target journalists? Why do they target Shireen Abu Akhla? It's obvious. Because they want to send a message. 
This is a dangerous assignment. If you are going to report on the Palestinian conflict from an Israeli side embedded with Israeli forces, you're safe. If you are going to report representing the Israeli perspective, you're safe. But if you are going to be like Shireen Abu Akla or any of these other journalists that I named, where you refuse to be embedded with Israeli forces and you say, I will go out there and be independent. I will report from whatever side I see as fair and professional, then that's a very dangerous assignment. And that is precisely why today very few journalists dare do what Shireen Abu Akhla did. This is precisely why most of the journalists, the vast majority of journalists who go to Palestine are embedded with the Israeli forces. Because journalists have gotten the message very clear. You either report the Israeli perspective or you risk great danger to yourself. That is precisely why all the reporting from the New York Times, Washington DC, all the British papers, they're embedded with the Israeli forces. Not independent, not embedded with, Palest with Palestinians, embedded with Israelis. Shireen Abu Akla had become a rare thing. Is this freedom of speech? Obviously not. But why can they get away with it? Because of the Khabal factor. As Allah warned us, they can do whatever they want to a Muslim. Or in this case, what is symbolically part of a Muslim cause, an American Christian Palestinian who reported on the truth. And because she reported on the truth, she became of a Muslim value and a Muslim morality. You can kill her and know that there will be no consequences. In the same way that Sisi of Egypt has learned, you can slaughter as many Egyptians as you want. As long as you have the Israelis as your friend, friends, you're fine. MBS got the point. You can just kill execute, murder, whoever you want. As long as you have the Israelis as your friends and the neocons as your friends and the Islam haters as, as your friends and the Islamophobes as your friends, you're fine. Same thing for Bahrain, same thing for the Emirat. And now I read that next on the line might be Indonesia. Israel is talking about Indonesia investing in Israel. <sighs> Turn you into dunces, lunatics, entities that lack any dignity or any respect. قولوا قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم اسال الله يستجب لكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى اله واصحابه يا رب العالمين a british journalist his name is peter oborn recently wrote a book. I tried to remember the name of his book, The Fate of Abraham, where Peter
here are born, among other things, documents how in Britain the emergence of a right-wing think tank changed British policy towards its own Muslim citizens and how the language of we are targeting Islamists and political Islam became a trope for violating the civil rights of Muslims throughout Britain and how that in turn also became the politics of language that is played around Muslims all over Europe. We are not targeting Muslims, we're targeting Islamists. We are targeting political Islam. What Peter O'Born doesn't talk about, how the infection of thinking, well, we don't have a problem with Islam, we have a problem with political Islam, spread to Muslims themselves. What Peter O'Born doesn't realize, although I, I think his book is wonderful, but he doesn't realize is the potency of a concept developed by ideologues, by ideologues, became intellectualized by Muslims so that they can kill their own faith. What he doesn't realize is how you can kill Khashoggi, and if anyone opens their mouth, you say, that's political Islam. Don't criticize, that's political Islam. You can kill Shireen Abu Akhla. If any Muslim wants to object, say, uh, you can't, that's political Islam. You can invest billions of dollars in the apartheid state of Israel. And if you try to protest that political Islam, if you say, how can it be that people of conscience call for divestment from Israel, and you Saudis, custodian of the two holy sites, are investing billions of dollars in Israel, that's political Islam. If you say, how can you, custodian of the two holy sites, have such an intimate, shami relationship, with the pioneers of Islamophobia in the world. That's political Islam. Shut up. It's political Islam. You see, the extent of Ya'luna Kum Khabala is when Allah told us, be careful. Because if you lose your relationship with my book and you get your value system, your epistemology, your awareness of the world from elsewhere other than this book, you will become like dunces, idiots, lunatics in this world. No one will respect you. No one will have any regard for you. Precisely. Do you think the Israelis respect the murderous, genocidal Sisi? Not for a second. Not for a second. Yes, they defend him and they think he's good enough for Egyptians. A Sisi, a Jewish Sisi, or an Israeli Sisi would be locked up in prison in a second. An Israeli MBS 
would be locked up in prison in a second. You're barbarians. You're good enough for your own people, for barbarians like you. But for us, no. This is precisely what racism is, people. This is precisely what racism is. So you see, the murder of the Christian American Shireen Abu Akla is an act of racism. It is part of the paradigm of Ya'lunakum Khabala. We can spit on your holy sites. We can violate your holy sites throughout Ramadan, spit on them, degrade them, deprecate them and murder your bearers of truth and know that you are khabal, you're lunatics. You won't have the wherewithal to even coordinate an appropriate response. You're going to protest, you're going to promise that they, you want to take it to the International Criminal Court of Justice, then nothing will happen, and we will do an internal investigation and whitewash the whole matter, and nothing will happen. Why? And here is the final big point. Because we, the Islamophobes, the Zionists, are willing to sacrifice for our cause. You Muslims, are willing to simply pontificate and talk about your causes. We raised $20 million to support pro-Israeli Democrats in one night. In one night. While you will talk about whether saying Allah about Shireen Abu Akla because she's Christian is halal or not. We will build societies that are very technologically advanced, that explore the issues of civil rights and human rights, etc. for us, for people like us, while you will be concerned about whether you can bury someone with wearing nail polish or not. Again, the words of Allah. You are lunatics. We are rational people. We treat you like you deserve to be treated as lunatics. In other words, for barbarians. While we are the civilized people. Inevitably, you get these young Muslims who say, ah, oh, come on, why are you telling all of this? What can we do about it? You see, this is part of how they made you a lunatic. Khabal, a dunce. When you see no value in intellectual understanding, that is part of the paradigm of Khabal. When you understand why Shireen Abu Akla is a Muslim issue, an Islamic issue, when you understand why every Muslim this Jum'ah should be talking about the assassination of Shireen Abu Akla, when you understand why every Muslim and every khutbah around the world should be talking about the assassination of Shireen and Abu Akla in connection with the continued Israeli violations against the Aqsa Mosque in connection with the $2 billion investment by MBS through Jared Kushner in Israel, in connection with the genocide against Muslims in China, in connection with the genocide against Muslims in Burma, and then you realize that we as Muslims finally might be emerging out of the khabal stage, out of the idiocy stage in our existence. But as long as 
after the fact is a single Jum'a. One Jum'a. And I bet it is a handful of Jum'as around the world and probably the only Jum'a in the United States that will talk about the assassination of Shireen Abu Akhla in context, in relation to the Jared Kushner investment of Saudi money in Israel, in relation to the violating of the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque. That's precisely, we are the Habans of the world. We are the lunatics of the world. We are the dunces of the world. Because awareness is the first step towards the construction of a dignified identity. Without awareness, there are no further steps. اللهم ارحمنا يا علي عظيم اللهم تب علينا واهدنا لأقرب من هذا رشدا يا رحمن يا رحيم الله forgive our sins الله grant us insight and knowledge and awareness and bring us closer to you and closer to your book يا علي عظيم يا رحمن يا رحيم وصلي وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأقم الصلاة